joining us uh, today. This is the first webinar of Massachusetts Peace Action's uh, Middle East Working Group. Uh, we're very excited uh, to start putting these on. Uh, Mass Peace Action, like so many other organizations in the time of coronavirus, uh, were unable to hold public events, uh, rallies, and demonstrations. So we have uh, transitioned over to virtual events. And uh, it's going very well so far. Uh, still a lot of energy. Uh, if anything, the, the response has been better than I expected. Uh, people are engaged. Uh, people are active. Uh, they, they still want to do things, even, even from quarantine. So uh, I'm very proud uh, of everyone still, still being involved to do peace and anti-war work with Mass Peace Action. So welcome to all of you and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we have a great program uh, today. Uh, Syria today, facing coronavirus in the midst of war and sanctions. Uh, Syria right now, uh, like every country in the world, uh, is facing a new crisis. It's been at war for over eight years now. I don't need another crisis, but we have one upon us, and that is the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And uh, living in a, in a war-torn environment, uh, as Syrians are, it can only make the outbreak of the virus uh, more devastating. Uh, the war has dramatically affected Syria's healthcare system, their pharmaceutical uh, industries, and the, the weakening of that infrastructure uh, can make life very difficult when it comes to fighting the virus. And one of the things that we've learned uh, from this pandemic is that we're all connected. But making, making it harder for Syrians to fight the virus in their own country uh, eventually means that the virus will continue to spread to the rest of the world threatening people in the United States, right here in Massachusetts, even uh, in our own neighborhoods. Um, so what we're, what we're here to, to do today is to raise awareness uh, about what, what people in the United States can do to try and press uh, for an end uh, to our participation in the war in Syria, which is ongoing, and an end to economic sanctions, which although they say they do not affect medicine and medical equipment. We have seen that they too often do. So now is not the time to be punishing people, uh, to be trying regime change, to be exploiting this crisis. Uh, now is the time for people all over the world to band together uh, to fight our, our common enemy, which is COVID-19. So we have uh, a couple of great speakers uh, today. Uh, the, the first, and I want to thank him for, for helping to organize uh, this program, is our board member, uh, Jeff Klein. He has direct experience in Syria. He has uh, visited the country three times since 2010, uh, most recently, I believe, in April of 2018. Uh, he has spoken to many of the people on the ground there uh, and uh, Syrian Americans as well. And he is going to give us some of the background uh, to the current crisis and a perspective that you don't hear uh, from mainstream media. So it's very important to, to get that view out there, uh, a view from the ground um, in Syria. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeff Klein. Jeff, I will unmute you now and take it away. So before I start, uh, Brian and Cole, I just had a message from Chantal that she can see and hear uh, this uh, webinar, but apparently she's not on as a panelist. Oh, there she is. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> just in the nick of time. Good. Good. Welcome, Chantal. Okay. Um, and if you want, oh, she seems to have disappeared again. Well, anyway, let's You're hope getting there. she gets back. <laughs> I pushed something called promote to panelist, and it said she will be rejoining as a panelist. I hope that didn't okay. knock her off or anything. 
it might have. But. All right. Well, thanks, uh, uh, Brian and Cole, for uh, organizing this. And uh, uh, to all of you who are uh, watching and listening, I hope that uh, you'll learn something from this uh, presentation and discussion uh, that probably, if you're like almost everybody in this country, uh, consists of information that you're not aware of. So uh, let me start. Here's a map of the uh, Middle East today. Uh, and um, few of us think about it, but uh, the world as we know it uh, is still very powerfully influenced by the legacy of colonialism. And uh, nowhere is that more true than the Middle East. Um, so before we get to Syria today, I'm going to just very briefly uh, go back in time a little bit to set the stage for what we're looking at today. Now, uh, before the First World War, uh, and for centuries before that, most of the Arab-speaking regions of uh, the Middle East and North Africa were under the control of the Ottoman Empire. But in, in the century before the First World War, in 1914, uh, little by little, the European powers uh, were taking bites out of the uh, Ottoman Empire, especially in North Africa, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, and around the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, were sort of biting off pieces of the Ottoman Empire that were largely Arabic speaking and Arabic uh, populated by Arabs. Uh, so that by uh, 1914, the Ottoman Empire was in green, much smaller, but it still included most of the Arabic speaking people in the Middle East. Uh, and when uh, the Ottomans, along with their allies, were defeated in the First World War, uh, the uh, peoples in the Middle East and elsewhere in the colonial world uh, wanted to exercise self-determination. Uh, and if they had done that, uh, it's very possible that there would be, instead of the balkanized uh, version of the Middle East we know today, it's very possible that there would have been uh, one or more larger Arab uh, majority states in the Middle East and there certainly would have been a much larger Arab state along the Levant, the area that uh, the Arabs referred to as uh, the land of Sham, Bilad Sham, which was not just uh, what came to be modern Syria, but the whole coast of the Eastern Mediterranean, including what's now uh, 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 Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine. But uh, during the First World War, the British and French and other allies uh, had secretly agreed not to allow independence of the Arab states in the Middle East, uh, but to divide it up between themselves. And this is the famous Sykes-Picot uh, secret agreement that was made in May 1916. And when the war ended, they implemented this by dividing uh, the area of uh, Sham uh, between them. Originally, by the way, Palestine was going to be shared by all the uh, allied powers because they all had religious connections with what they call the Holy Land. But uh, in a revision uh, to the Zeisbico Agreement, the British got complete control over Palestine and also part of what had originally been uh, given to the French, the northern part of what is Iraq today, because uh, they knew there was a lot of oil around Mosul. So the British traded uh, with the French to get this area of, uh, of uh, the French mandate in return for giving the French a free hand in uh, the territories that they controlled. And it, uh, it took a long time for the, uh, uh, the peoples of the Middle East and North Africa to achieve actual independence. Uh, in real sense, none of them were truly independent uh, until after the Second World War. Uh, after various uh, elements of struggle, notably in Algeria, uh, the people had to wage a long and bloody uh, liberation war to achieve their independence from the French in 1962. Uh, the others uh, got some kind of independence earlier, but uh, mo for the most part, were not completely free and independent until the 1950s. And the borders that we see today followed the borders that were set by the uh, British and French in the agreements they made during the First World War. Now, 
the old fashioned kind of colonialism is, uh, is done uh, for the time being, uh, but the US has replaced the French and the British in the Middle East by a kind of neo-colonialism and militarism. So that today, what we call the Middle East, the Pentagon calls CENTCOM, the Central Command, whose uh, headquarters is in Tampa, Florida, 7,000 miles away from the Middle East. And CENTCOM is uh, one of a number of US military commands that spans the entire globe, and the Middle East being one of the most important ones, uh, principally because what you see here, because of oil. This is a kind of tongue in cheek map of the Middle East as seen by uh, the United States, where instead of the country names, they, they show them as sources of oil. So let's get back to uh, Syria. Uh, this is the French mandate of Syria. Uh, and this, by the way, is the uh, French mandate flag that you see uh, used by some of the rebels. Uh, this is the modern border of Syria uh, after the French split off Lebanon and gave part of Syria to Turkey just before the Second World War. Uh, and for the rest of Syria, uh, as colonial powers do, uh, they understood that it would be easier to rule by dividing up the population. Uh, they understood that the, uh, the headquarters of the sort of Arab nationalism in Syria were in Aleppo and Damascus, uh, principally at that time, uh, Sunni Muslim and population. And they divided it up so that Aleppo and Damascus were in two different states. They had a separate Alawite state along the coast and a separate Druze state in the southern part of, uh, of Syria. And to the south, uh, part of what was the Balad al-Sham was given to the British and became uh, Palestine and Jordan. And to the east, part of it became uh, uh, modern day uh, Iraq. So this is, this is the French version of, of uh, Syria, but it largely follows, the, with the exception of this part that was given to Turkey, follows the modern borders of the Syrian state. Now, there's a very widespread narrative of, of uh, what happened, what's happening and the situation in Syria that is spread by the mainstream media, uh, liberals in Congress, as well as conservatives, Republicans and Democrats, and even some parts of the left that characterizes Syria as this way, that the lone monster dictator Assad is standing on the ruins of his country, uh, a vicious dictator who has no support among his people, who oversaw the destruction of his country that's now in ruins, uh, and uh, and that partly the reason for this terrible outcome, according to this narrative, is that the US didn't intervene in Syria enough. Uh, we'll see that that's pretty much the opposite of true and all the other things that people believe, including uh, many of us uh, in, uh, in peace action and elsewhere, uh, is either completely false or, or certainly incomplete. And before we go on, just uh, look at this map a little bit so you understand what we're talking about. Most of the population of Syria lives in this strip along the western part of the country where the major cities are located, Damascus, Homs, Hama, uh, Aleppo, and uh, along the coast, Latakia and Tartus. Uh, the rest of the country is much less densely populated. And there are a few smaller cities in the east, Raqqa, Deir Azor, and Hasaka, but this is the main population axis of Syria here. So first on the issue of how destroyed the country is, it certainly is true that uh, the war has led to a lot of destruction. Uh, this is a picture I took in Homs in 2016, uh, which was a scene of very heavy fighting in part of the city, and you can see the damage is considerable. But we need to point out that uh, this is a view of Raqqa. And Raqqa was flattened not by the Syrian government, by the US Air Force. Uh, uh, and uh, thousands of civilians were killed in that attack. Very little reported in our press. On the other hand, uh, it may surprise uh, a lot of viewers to know 
that a lot of Syria is still pretty much intact today. Uh, uh, many of the major cities were the scene of only intermittent violence, uh, especially Damascus. Uh, most of Aleppo, which you're looking at uh, in this picture, uh, Hama uh, and uh, Tartus and Latakia are pretty, pretty intact, uh, even after this long period of war. And uh, it's, it, it always surprises me, uh, looking at this picture, contemporary picture of uh, Aleppo, that many people I speak to, even in peace action, have this idea that Assad besieged and destroyed Aleppo. And we'll come back to that. But the fact is that the majority of the population of Aleppo lived in the western part of the city. And uh, despite intermittent attacks by rockets and artillery from the military opposition to the government, uh, the city is substantially intact today. We'll get back to Aleppo later because it's important. Now, Syria, uh, as some of you may know, has uh, uh, many different religious and ethnic uh, groups in it, and I'll, I'll get into detail, but I want to show this is typical of maps that are circulating among uh, American government and liberal media that seem to show and suggest that Syria could be partitioned into different ethnic groups along the same lines that the French proposed uh, when they had their mandate. But the actual reality is much more complex. Uh, there's no area of Syria that's ethnically homogeneous. The country is a mosaic of uh, religious and ethnic uh, groups of various kinds, and all the major cities are uh, also, also multicultural. Sunni and Shia and Alawite Muslims, uh, various Christian sects, Kurds, and so on, live in all the major cities in Syria. <coughs> um, the uh, pie chart on the left is an estimate of the, uh, the ethno-religious composition of Syria based on, partly on speculation because uh, the Syrian censuses do not ask for people's religious affiliation. So these population estimates are, are inferred from other sources, but you can see the majority of the country is a Sunni Muslim, but there are Alawite, uh, and Christian minorities, uh, Druze, and smaller minorities. And among the Christians, there are many different uh, Christian churches in Syria. And as I said, all the major cities are ethnic mosaics of many different uh, religious and, and cultural groups. Here's an example. <coughs> this is a view of uh, the old city of Damascus. The eastern part of the old city of Damascus is traditionally the Christian part of the city, and you can see churches of many different, there are a dozen different Christian sects in Syria, although Orthodox Christianity is the largest. And uh, you often have, even in uh, Babtuma, the Christian part of the old city, you have mosques cheek by jowl with, uh, with Christian churches. So the tradition in Syria, in modern Syria, is uh, religious tolerance and, uh, and multiculturalism. Now, uh, when the Arab Spring broke out, uh, starting in Tunisia, then Egypt, um, there was legitimate reason for people in Syria to protest. Uh, Syria was ruled uh, effectively by a one-party uh, government of the Ba'ath Arab Ba'ath Party and had been led by the Assad's Hafez and then Bashar uh, for decades. And certainly there was a legitimate desire for democratic reforms in Syria. But uh, the reform movement was very quickly overtaken by a more radical desire to completely overthrow the regime that was encouraged by the United States and its allies in the Gulf and Turkey. Uh, so that even when the government responded to the early protests with significant reforms, uh, the opposition up the ante, so to speak, to demand the overthrow of the government and began to display uh, the, the anti-government flag that you see there. The early demonstrations were much more mixed. They were secular and democratic reformers that uh, wanted some change, but they were very quickly overtaken by a more radical and more sectarian Sunni-based opposition, 
which was influenced by uh, uh, preachers and money from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey that had been promoting a kind of Islamist view, especially in the periphery of the major cities where uh, the neighborhoods were pretty poor and, uh, and they had some success. There's a lot of debate uh, over to what extent uh, the opposition was peaceful and then only responded in an armed way after they were attacked by the government. Uh, what's, what's most plausible from my understanding is that uh, the, the opposition was very, very quickly overtaken by uh, a sectarian orientation and was armed, if not at the very beginning, but very soon. And so that if you go back and read the reports from the early days of the war in 2011, uh, there were very, very significant casualties among the Syrian police and armed forces at the beginning of the struggle, uh, which uh, like a lot of uh, uh, understanding of this has sort of fallen out of uh, the narrative that's promoted in our media. Now, I also wanna point out in passing that uh, Syria may be the first place in modern times where climate change played a really significant role in fomenting uh, uh, political uh, uprising. Uh, Syria was, uh, had a very severe drought uh, in the years leading up to uh, the Arab Spring. And during this drought, many, many uh, thousands of people from the rural population, the rural agricultural population, uh, moved off their land to the area of neighborhoods around the major cities and it was this area where uh, 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 missionaries from Saudi Arabia and elsewhere uh, were very effective in agitating in an Islamist direction against the government, which uh, one of its distinguishing factors was multicultural and non-sectarian, secular. So uh, there certainly was opposition to the government. There's no question about it. And certainly our media played this up to a, a large degree. But what you're never allowed to see is that there was a significant support for the government as well. The government had a strong social basis in Syria. Uh, before the war, there were more than 2 million Ba'ath Party members among a population of 22 million or so in Syria, uh, as well as uh, the urban population of uh, minorities and urbanized Sunni uh, definitely were fearful of uh, the outcome if uh, the opposition took power. Uh, that is the secular nature of the state, the tolerant nature of the state uh, was threatened by uh, the, what had become a largely Islamist radical opposition so that uh, there were massive outpourings of support for the government this is in Damascus, and this is in Aleppo in 2011. And you may uh, remember that when presidential elections were held in 2014, uh, with opposition for the first time on the ballot, uh, thousands and thousands of Syrian refugees in Beirut and Amman crowded the Syrian embassy to vote. Uh, so it's a sign, we tend to believe that all the refugees outside Syria were opposed to the government, but it certainly isn't true. Uh, many of them, if not most of them, were fleeing the war and uh, there was a lot of support for the government, uh, as you can see from this picture. Now, my take is that uh, the hardcore supporters of uh, regime change in Syria and the hardcore uh, supporters of the government are probably each minorities of the population. A much larger group, and I would think the majority, uh, takes the position that there are things to criticize in Syria and they would like reforms. Uh, they certainly deserve a better government uh, than they have uh, sometimes uh, had, but uh, they fear uh, a worse situation if this government is overthrown. And I. I show you a picture on the left of my friend uh, Abdul Razak, who was a tour guide for us in 2018, a Sunni Muslim uh, who lived in the old city of Damascus. And uh, he would acknowledge that 
there were things to criticize about the government. And he even joked that when the war was over, maybe he'd become part of the political opposition. But as he put it, uh, during this war, uh, you don't argue about what color to paint the walls when your house is burning down. Uh, so I think his opinion represents uh, a significant number, probably a majority of the Syrians who have their criticisms of the government, uh, but fear uh, the overthrow of the government would make things worse rather than better. Uh, the opposition, uh, as it became militarized, and as the government failed to collapse, uh, began to demand that uh, the US and its NATO allies intervene in Syria to overthrow the government for them. And uh, this was a very common sight. This is a, a, a banner and, and demonstration from August 2011, uh, demanding that NATO come and, uh, and overthrow the government of Syria. They call it the Shabiha, which are the gangsters effectively, but they wanted foreign intervention to destroy the government of Syria. And this wasn't an idle hope. You can see they're carrying a poster here with Gaddafi on one side and Assad on the other. And uh, this was because uh, only a few months before, the U.S. had succeeded in getting Security Council clearance to create a no-fly zone in Libya, uh, which quickly evolved into an air force on behalf of Gaddafi's opponents. And they succeeded in uh, deposing uh, the Gaddafi government of Libya and later uh, uh, bombed a convoy that Gaddafi was, uh, was uh, in, uh, this is in October 2011, and allowed rebels to capture, torture, and kill him. And this was, if it works, this was Hillary Clinton's. <laughs> so it's a reminder uh, to me and to all of you that in the 2016 election, there were two sociopath candidates. Uh, this was the one who didn't win, but it's, it explains why in the Middle East, uh, despite many misgivings, uh, people were hoping for the election of Donald Trump because they knew Clinton very well. They knew her history of intervention in the Middle East and uh, uncritical support for Israel, and they hoped sadly, uh, without uh, success, that Trump might be something different. Uh, so again, it's a reminder that it wasn't Trump, as bad as he is and as, as, as bad as in his interventions in Syria has been, the origins of our policy of intervening and regime change in Syria are in the Obama administration, not the Trump administration. Uh, and when Obama came out in the summer of 2011 demanding that Assad has to step aside, Assad must go, this gave hope to the opposition forces that the US basically would do the job for them. And it wasn't just talk, the US and its allies flooded Syria on behalf of the opposition with billions of dollars worth of weapons of all kinds, uh, training, and propaganda on behalf of the armed rebels who by this time uh, were hoping not for a Democrat, for the most part, hoping not for a democratic Syria, but for an Islamist religious sectarian regime. By pretty early on, uh, the armed opposition in particular was almost entirely Sunni, uh, although they didn't have the support of the majority of Sunnis in, in Syria who lived uh, in the Western part of the country. But the opposition took on a sectarian Sunni Muslim uh, character, and the U.S. Uh, searched in vain for moderate rebels that they could support, uh, and effectively there were none uh, very shortly after the, uh, the war started. Uh, and, but the Saudis and the Qataris and the Turks continued to support uh, the armed Islamist forces in Syria and facilitated the entry into Syria of tens of thousands of foreign fighters, jihadist fighters uh, from all over the world, entering Syria through the open borders of Turkey uh, and Jordan, and further radicalizing the opposition uh, in Syria. And again, 
for the most part, by now, despite the propaganda, most of the people fighting against the Syrian government are not Democrats who envision uh, a liberal uh, democratic Syria, but people who are fighting on a religious basis to impose a Sunni Muslim religious regime in Syria. Uh, in 2013, when the Syrian government was uh, on, the, on the defense militarily, uh, they got some help from Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. Uh, Hezbollah, based on the Shia community in Lebanon, uh, saw their compatriots uh, under threat in Syria. This is a picture from a, a Shia village in the Bekaa Valley uh, that I know very well of fighters who were on their way uh, to Syria, and they were successful in aiding the government, uh, in, especially in the area around uh, the Lebanese border. Now, uh, I mentioned Aleppo earlier. Uh, people believe that uh, Aleppo was besieged and destroyed by Assad, but the fact is that there was never an armed uprising indigenous to Aleppo. Instead, the eastern part of the city was infiltrated uh, by uh, armed rebels from outside, effectively, and were able to establish themselves in the old city of Aleppo and the eastern suburbs, but the majority of the city always stayed in government hands. Uh, and despite what you may have seen, PBS and elsewhere showed uh, the pity of uh, the people in, uh, eastern, uh, in eastern Aleppo, uh, including a documentary uh, for Sama that many of you may have seen on PBS. Uh, this represented a small fraction of the population of Aleppo. Uh, and in fact, the majority of people on Aleppo were celebrated when uh, the city was, the eastern part of the city was liberated in uh, the end of 2016. And I hope this video will play. This is a little clip from a pro-government video, uh, which you can take with a grain of salt, but uh, don't let it fool your eyes. The, these are people in Aleppo celebrating uh, the so-called fall of the eastern part of the city. To suggest that that uh, Jeff, I'm just going to break in. The sound is kind of problematic on these videos, so you might want to be cautious about showing. So uh, again, I don't want to suggest that Syrians are unanimously supporting their government, but uh, just to remind people that the, the the Syrians who do support the government are never allowed to be seen in our media. Uh, and I hope Chantal and Amar will speak about that uh, to a certain degree. Well. Here's the situation today from the low point of government control that's shown on the left in red to the situation today with the government uh, uh, controlling most of the central and western part of Syria, with the exception of areas that are occupied uh, by Turkey in the north here, uh, and Idlib, part of Idlib province, which is still occupied by anti-government armed forces. And uh, the Syrians, uh, the ones supporting the government, well understand that they got uh, major support in retaking or liberating, as they would call it, most of their country from Hezbollah that I already saw from the Iranians and from the Russians. And if you move around Syria today, you will often see posters like this showing uh, people who are regarded as the supporters of Syria. This is Hassan Nasrallah. Hassan Rouhani, in, uh, uh, Nasrallah is the head of Hezbollah, Rouhani, the president of, uh, of Iran, 
and Vladimir Putin, who is sometimes called Abu Ali by Syrians. Uh, and uh, these are the forces that for many Syrians sort of saved their country. Now, Syria is uh, still faces, even though the war is substantially won by the government, they still face many uh, significant problems, one of which is the millions of, uh, exi of, of refugees that have fled Syria, fled the fighting, or opposed the government and left. Uh, they're in transit camps in Turkey and uh, in parts of Europe. And having them return, the ones who want to, and reintegrating them into Syrian society is a real challenge. There are also millions of internal refugees. Uh, for the most part, inside Syria, these are refugees who fled from rebel-held areas to government-held areas. Uh, and they also uh, will have to eventually return to their homes and be reintegrated. And when I was in Syria in 2018, uh, we visited a, uh, a refugee camp uh, that housed uh, people from Ghouta, the area just near Damascus that had been liberated in the spring of 2018. Uh, this is a view of that camp, which is a former army base. And uh, in Ghouta, like the other areas that were liberated from the government, uh, the government offered uh, the people there the choice of either staying uh, in the areas controlled by the government or leaving uh, for the uh, area controlled by the opposition, in Idlib in this case, and both in Ghouta and Dara and Aleppo, the vast majority of the people in those areas chose to stay in the government-held areas, and only a minority of uh, rebel fighters and their families uh, chose to go to uh, Idlib. Uh, parts of Syria are still occupied by foreign powers, principally uh, Turkey in the north and uh, the U.S. in the east, including, as Trump says, uh, to secure the oil in the eastern part of Syria, uh, which is a way of denying the oil and the revenue uh, to the Syrian government. Uh, rebuilding is taking place. Uh, on the right, there are two pictures of uh, part of the, the part of Aleppo, the eastern part of Aleppo that was a scene of fighting uh, in uh, before 2016. And you can see below uh, parts of the city have already been reconstructed. I visited Aleppo in 2018. And this area, uh, which uh, the cafes that overlook the, the citadel of, uh, of uh, Aleppo are now open and, and uh, and uh, patronized by families uh, and so on. So a lot of reconstruction has already happened, but the cost of rebuilding the rest of the country will be huge. In particular, uh, a huge amount of damage was done to the Syrian industrial infrastructure. Syria, you might not know, had a pretty in advanced industrial capacity, uh, especially around Aleppo. Uh, and uh, the uh, Sheikh Najjar industrial city near Aleppo had been occupied by the rebels. They destroyed a lot and sold a lot of the machinery from the factories to the Turks, who sent ship lo uh, bus loads and truck loads of equipment from Aleppo. But now they're beginning to rebuild. A number of factories are, uh, have reopened that we visited. And uh, the machinery, uh, this is a textile factory. This is a plastics manufacturing factory. Uh, the equipment now is principally from China. Uh, which is becoming the, the, the main economic partner of Syria. Now, among the damage that was done in the war, uh, especially the healthcare sector suffered. Syria had a very advanced uh, healthcare uh, system uh, of uh, free hospitals and clinics. Uh, it had a robust uh, pharmaceutical industry. <coughs> and we met with... Uh, this is Elizabeth Hoff on the right. She's the uh, WHO representative in Damascus. She's Norwegian, actually. And she reported that 90% of the Syrian healthcare infrastructure was either destroyed or severely damaged. And particularly the pharmaceutical industry, which had supplied <coughs> almost all of Syria's needs before the war, including advanced uh, cancer chemicals and so on, uh, was struggling 
to uh, reach even a fraction of the capacity they held they had before the war, principally because the equipment for the pharmaceutical industry had previously come mostly from Europe and elsewhere, and they couldn't get parts and, uh, and machinery to rebuild that industry because of the sanctions. Uh, the sanctions have hit the medical sector in Syria particularly hard. And for example, polio, which had been eradicated in Syria in the 1990s, has resurged in parts of the country uh, because of the war and the difficulty of uh, inoculating all the, uh, the children that had been universal beforehand. Uh, and because the healthcare system is struggling, people who used to be able to get care in government hospitals and clinics now cannot always. And I want to tell just a brief story <clears throat> about one instance. Uh, a friend of mine here, a Syrian American, put me in touch with a family uh, of friends in Syria whose mother had cancer. And before the war, she would have been able to get treatment in Syria, but because of the sanctions, uh, the procedures and the uh, chemotherapy medicines that she needed were not available in Syria. Uh, so they had to try to get treatment for her in Lebanon. In Lebanon, the healthcare system is private and they had to raise money for her care. They had to raise $40,000 for her care and they sold virtually all their property. Uh, and eventually, with some help from, from friends, including me, were able to secure uh, the surgery that she needed, but it was too late and she passed away anyway. Uh, they had to pay $40,000 up front to get her treated in Lebanon, whereas it would have been before the war, she would have had free treatment within Syria. So uh, I'll turn it over now to our uh, other panelists. Uh, and of course, I'm sure some people have questions, but. Uh, I'd love uh, uh, Chantal and then Amar to respond to uh, you know, what I presented and explain who they are and what their situation during the war and now has been and, and anything else they care to talk about. So Chantal, if you're, if you're uh, ready, uh, if you can be unmuted. You need to uh, click on that microphone, good. Go ahead, yeah, I've unmuted her, and just before Chantal starts, and thank, I'm so glad you're able to join us. But if yeah, people have you. questions, uh, the, the Q and A uh, button on uh, the lower part of your screen, just to the left of center, type your questions in there, and at the end of the program, uh, we'll be happy to answer as many as we can. Um, take it away, okay. Chantal. Okay, you hear me now? You hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Do you want to ask me something or I go on? I talk. Please, please explain who you are and uh, where you are and, uh, okay. and what you experienced during the war. Okay. I'm uh, here in Aleppo. I never left during the war. I am mother of three children and we live here in Aleppo, it, who was, uh, which was a beautiful country, a beautiful city, uh, economically, socially, everything. During the, at the beginning of the war, there was a little, a little, a little protest here in 2012, not at the beginning, by uh, a little bit of the, some people. And then it, uh, very quickly it became uh, with arms. And then 2012, they besieged the, uh, the east side of uh, barbarians come and be besieged the east side of uh, Aleppo. And uh, they cut power electricity, water, they cut us from up everything, even from food. Uh, even we couldn't have food, but we remain because of the strategic storage that was here in this part of Aleppo, of food storage, uh, fuel and uh, wheat and everything. There was a little pay, a little small road that was open, but not for everybody, because but uh, we cannot, uh, for example, I cannot go there to the other side because I or be killed or kidnapped for a ransom. So not everybody can could go to the other side, which was uh, the, the rebels, which are for me are terrorists, uh, were radical, were all all or uh, Daesh or Al Qaeda. No, no, there was in Aleppo there was no uh, democratic democratic rebels at all. 
at all. And then uh, after that, the army uh, could open a, a road to Hamas. It was funny because the, this road, and it caused a lot, hundreds of martyrs to open this road. At the uh, right side, it was all Al-Qaeda, and at the left side, it was all Daesh. So it was very dangerous, but uh, this is what the situation. Until 200, uh, 2017, it was a liber full liberation, and uh, we could live again. And uh, I want to tell you that everybody, all the, even the poor pe people of Aleppo, one, I saw one question of the, of the participant, even the poor people came, if, it, if there wasn't the, uh, the family of the rebels, they, they all came to the side of the government, of the west side of Aleppo, to live here with us. They didn't go and stay with, with the others. And we were living without food, without electricity, and with uh, there were always bombs and artillery and uh, uh, mortars on, uh, over our head. Uh, hospitals here were always full with people killed or injured or because of everybody, every, every day, every day, every day, there was so many bombs over our head. So when, when the government finally could uh, uh, liberate the, the other part, it was really uh, the picture you, you put. Maybe I was with those people. It was a great, a great, a great day when uh, Aleppo was liberated. So this, those pictures, nobody, nobody saw them. In the, there was a, lit, a, a lot of misinformation in the Western uh, uh, media about the real situation in Aleppo. And now, thanks God, now because of the great army, we have been liberated and now starting to live a normal life. And, but with the sanctions, it's very difficult for us to continue because the sanctions are very, very, very much, uh, how can I say, strong and uh, hard, hard for, the, for, the, for us in the, in the country here. In any way, in the, in the electrical way, in the electrical sector, in the health sector, industrial sector, fuel. Here, we have no fuel. Uh, for heating, for that. We have to bring from other countries, and the U.S. is taking our fuel, and we have to bring, but they cannot, they don't leave the uh, shipments of fuel to arrive to our country. So, it's hard, but we are hanging on. <laughs> and we, uh, we were here all during all the wars. If somebody wants to ask something. You hear me? Sure. Sorry, I need to unmute the other uh, participants. Um, Jeff, did you want to ask uh, Chantal any any more questions before we move on to Omar? And I'm then at the end of the program, we'll get uh, questions from uh, the audience. Okay. Just uh, just to be clear, Chantal, mm -hmm. uh, the majority of the population in Aleppo lived in the western part of the city that yes. was always under government control. Is that right? Yes, yes, the majority. But I say, but only the, the families of the rebels, of, of, because of the uh, east side of the country of Aleppo, there was a lot of uh, coming from the uh, countryside of Aleppo. All the, the people from the countryside, when they came, they, they, uh, inhabit, in, they inhabit in the uh, east side, not the west side. But the real Aleppian people were, came all to, to the side of the government, government during the war and stay, remained here, protected by the army. They didn't went to the other side. They, all they were here. Because that, now here it was uh, not safer, but uh, uh, Aleppo, it was Aleppo, what can I say? It was their country. Not there it was very strange because it was strange people who came, something we are not used to. The terrorists, we are not used to those people. Here in Aleppo, uh, before the war, it was maybe the safest, uh, Syria was the safest town in, uh, the safest country in the world. No problem with anything. The shops, the gold shop, n nobody has security here in, uh, in Syria. It was very safe. Uh, after that, what happened, it was 
you see, like something came from another uh, world, from another country, all that. It was very strange. We never believed that we can, that there is people, Syrian people, who can act like this. But it, it, it appeared that they were all, uh, I want to uh, tell you a story. Once when there was protest in Syria, I had a help, a help at my home. She said, uh, during those days, she took, she had uh, 500 uh, Syrian pounds by day at my place. I give her 500 pounds uh, every day. She, she told me, you say, Madam, I have to go uh, all fr every Friday. I cannot come. I say, why? I say, because uh, I am from Marit and Amman, which is an uh, Idlib province, a province in Idlib. Uh, she said, I, I want to go there every Friday because they pay me uh, 2,000 Syrian pounds if I go in the manifestation. And she has five children. They gave, they gave her 500 Syrian pounds to every, to every kid. She, she brings with her. So you see, I gave her 500 pounds during the day. This, this is what we pay here, Yanni, 10, 10, 12 dollars by day. Uh, there, she had, she go every Friday to, the, to make protests and she for money. This is a real story, Yanni. This is the help. I know her, Yanni. And a lot of people like this. This is, nobody knew about it. In, in the West, you don't hear like, a story like this. And uh, yeah, it, it, I don't know. And then what uh, happened? It, uh, we don't, we don't, we didn't see that everybody was besieged. We were besieged from every part of the city, and it was, it was very horrible, horrible, horrible. But uh, the people who remained in this count, in this side of the country, believed that at the end the Syrian army will prevail and will uh, protect us. But in 200, uh, in 2014, it, it, when Idlib, uh, 15, when Idlib uh, was taken by the rebels, there people start to think that we should leave, leave the country, because it was very scary. We were afraid that those rebels came and and take uh, over uh, Aleppo. It was very uh, uh, electricity start now <laughs> at my home because of <laughs> no fuel. <laughs> Now, you see, and we live like this, we have a lot, a lot of uh, shortage of electricity here because no fuel, because of the sanctions. Oh, yes, and, uh, and, and to, uh, 2014, the people start, when after Idlib, start to fear for their life in Aleppo, and they thought to leave. And then Putin came and <laughs> Russia came and helped the Syrian army, and we're now we're safe, we are safe again. Mm. Thank you. I wonder if we could hear from Amar now. Uh, Amar is also from Aleppo, and maybe you can explain your background, but he's in Newton now. Hi, Jeff. Hi, everybody. I want to start, Jeff, by saying uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. It's really very true and very fair when I say. I would uh, say also that you are maybe well informed than, uh, about the Syrian situation more than many Syrians, including myself especially this Abu Ali thing that's about Putin. <laughs> it was nice. Uh, it's just really nice presentation. And uh, thank you, Chantal, as well, for her genuine and spontaneous explanation for the suffer of the Aleppo people, especially. Very briefly, uh, uh, as everybody knows, that the war started in March 2011. And... Uh, during the first year, like what Chantal said, Aleppo was completely out of the thing and was uh, completely reluctant for any participating in this crazy war. And that's why uh, when the people decide to punish Aleppo for uh, not participating after uh, like maybe 15 months of the war, Halab was invaded, Aleppo was invaded by a group of radicalists, militia, that they took over uh, most parts of the eastern Aleppo and they managed later to uh, isolate Aleppo completely for over than three months and nobody can come in or come out of uh, go out of the city uh, eventually in uh, in uh, August 1st I managed 2012 I managed to leave the country with my two kids and my wife uh, we, but we had to go through a checkpoint for uh, these radical groups, were known later as 
ISIS. We passed that because they were holding the airport. The airport was still under the government control, but the road was completely uh, uh, blocked by ISIS checkpoints. And we have, back then it was not ISIS yet, but they are later was known as the ISIS. I had to go through this checkpoint like five minutes with my two kids and it was a really very bad five minutes, you know, when your live stream completely goes in front of your eyes and you just you just you just think with the man for some times in 2013 I am um, because of my dual citizenship status. I was uh, able to travel to the United States and we were back and forth till 2016. We completely settled in the United States. Uh, I went, uh, I visited back in 2014 and again in 2015. I'm, an, I'm still in very good contact with the people over there on a daily contact. I have my sister over there and her family and other family members also. And I have many, many friends are in contact with me on a daily basis. So uh, for 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 the the sanction things and Syria, what's really concerning me uh, is uh, Syria today, as everybody knows, under sanctions since two thousand one, I believe, when the Americans issued the punishment law for to punish Syrian regime and Syrian, and we are under sanctions since then. So 20 years of sanctions plus 10 years of devastating war that has left the country completely vulnerable for uh, any kinds, you can name it, any kinds of things. All the sectors in the country are severely damaged. Everything means everything. So, but in concern of the coronavirus, we are facing a completely devastated uh, health sector that is not able to function at all uh, because of, you know what, the, the, the hospitals in Syria are already overwhelmed because of the war casualties and there's no enough beds to anyone. And as well, as you mentioned, uh, Jeff, it's uh, the, the pharmaceutical uh, industry is completely destroyed in Syria, which were before the war was able completely to cover every single needs for the Syrian. It was developed industry, but unfortunately, the, the, the factories the, uh, for uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry was in the suburbs of Aleppo, where the rebellions, or what do you call them, rebellions, some of people, I call them terrorists for sure, they took over that part of um, of industry and they keep, keep they keep the manufacturers functioning, but they took over the, uh, the outcome. They could, took over the medicines and they were selling in a black market for their people and trade them with our friend, um, unfortunately, our, our NATO, partner Turkey. So uh, also uh, it was a huge shortage in every kind of uh, equipment. I was talking to a friend doctor yesterday in Aleppo and he assured to me that you can imagine that all Syria has now 500 ventilators only. The whole country is functioning on 500 ventilators only. And you know the population in Syria with displaced people, whatever you can count them, where are they? They are 23 million Syrians almost, and they have only 500 uh, ventilators. So if you can imagine, guys, that a country like the United States and Europe are facing shortage in the equipment, in the medical equipment, with the all uh, huge resources that they have, can you imagine the Syrians after 20 years of sanctions and after 10 years of devastating war, how they would face, uh, face the coronavirus if, if they decide to outbreak in Syria? It's, 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 you cannot tell how, how bad it will be. Especially now, Aleppo, as you showed in the map, Jeff, it's like almost 25 miles away from the Turkish border. And Turkey now is facing a big outbreak in the coronavirus recently. And it's listed almost, I believe it's number seven on the list now for the coronavirus. And it started to outbreak badly. And if that's happened for Turkey, it's definitely coming to Syria. As Unfortunately, we don't have statistics. We don't have numbers that tells the truth. But that's what's, what's 
for sure will happen because the, 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 you know, the Turkey is letting the people comes and goes out without any security on the borders. So uh, finally, what I want to say here, it's it, this, the question, the legitimate question to ask here is this, is this sanctions are feasible? Is it really serve the purpose that why, wha, what was made for? The simple answer is completely no. Because if you take the history of these sanctions, Syria since 2001, Iran since 18, uh, 1989 under sanctions, uh, uh, 79, I'm sorry, under sanctions. Korea, North Korea was, I don't know, since forever under sanctions. Hezbollah under sanctions. And even the funny things, you know, ISIS was fighting the United States and they were managed to trade oil with our partner, NATO, Turkey. So even America was sieging, uh, sanctioning ISIS. During the war with ISIS, they were managed to trade oil. I don't know how, how, how that's happened, but and you can tell me how the, the Americans was letting that happen, but they were able to manage to trade oil with Turkey. And, and eventually these sanctions, Iran is there. They are, they are developing a nuclear uh, program. Nobody can stop them. Korea is the same. And eventually Korea is, uh, Jim, uh, Kim uh, Il Jong is meeting Trump, like, man to man like a peer for him you know nothing changed and everybody the only thing that's changed is the people are suffering the ordinary people are suffering so this sanction is is unfeasible for sure it doesn't serve anything except punishing a collective punishment for the syrian ordinary people and those people are gonna face now the outbreak of the coronavirus on top of their other problems with this just bare hands they can do anything. You just have to pray and pray and pray and nothing they can do. So I would say thank you guys, everybody here for this initiative. It's a really clear message. And I agree on this message is enough is enough for this. I hope that's made myself clear. Thank you guys. Thanks, Amar. Uh, I want to uh, hurry up and get to questions uh, right now. Uh, we've got a lot of good questions coming in, but I want to thank you both uh, for your perspective that you shared. Uh, it's, that's not something that we hear, as I'm sure you know, Amar. Uh, it's not heard here in the United States. It's The coverage has been extremely one-sided. Uh, so we appreciate uh, hearing a different perspective uh, for sure from the ground. Uh, let's jump right into questions. Uh, this one came in early, so I will address it to you, Jeff. Um, let's see, isn't it, and it's an anonymous question, isn't it more accurate to say that it was foreign intervention and the government's repression that caused the quick radicalization of the opposition? Uh, this this uh, person who asked the question cites uh, that the government released thousands of Muslim Brotherhood prisoners uh, at the same time uh, the Gulf states were sending in weapons to Syria. Your response, Jeff. And I'll make sure you're unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you. You know, there's a lot of disagreement about what happened at the very beginning of uh, the protests. Um, one of the demands of the protesters, you know, the the democratically oriented protesters was the release of political prisoners. And one of the responses from the government, among other reforms that were offered early on, was to release political prisoners, which in Syria were primarily Islamists, uh, often connected with the Muslim brother. This was a demand of the opposition, and the Syrian, the Syrian government, you know, acceded to it. Uh, so, this idea that releasing the, the, the radical Islamists from the jails was some kind of devious plot to sort of uh, bolster the, uh, the religious opposition, I think has been debunked pretty thoroughly. Uh, uh, now, on the other hand, it's true that uh, various abuses and, and, uh, and uh, dictatorial uh, behavior by the government and its uh, security uh, organs had something to do with fostering an opposition, no question about it. But the more democratically minded opposition quickly withdrew for the most part. The ones, the secular Democrats that participated in the protests at the very beginning of the crisis, uh, many of them withdrew 
when uh, the center of gravity of the opposition had moved to a sectarian uh, Sunni uh, relation. There are lots of testimony of people who participated early on and then saw what was going on and, and withdrew and came to either be neutral or support the government. And, and I don't know if uh, Amar and Chantal have something to say about that, but uh, please do. I can I can say I can say exactly. Uh, look, Syria definitely needs democracy. That's 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 not negotiable here. But uh, at the very beginning, when he released the prisoners, that exactly what you said, Jeff. It was a demand of the opposition, and everybody was accusing him. You know, if you don't release them, you capture the people against their will for political reasons, and blah blah blah. And now, if you release them, you are in. Ah, oh, okay, you are send them to fight against. So what do you want, guys? So the thing is, Assad, in the, during the first six months, he went on public and he admit clearly that, guys, we need to change things in Syria. We need to make things goes better. We need to do and blah, 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 blah. And I still remember very well the very, uh, very uh, beginning in 10 days in Homs when the uh, rebels or uh, the protesters was uh, just asking to change the mayor. Only what they're demanding is to change the mayor. And within 10 days, even the mayor was a close friend for the Assad himself. And in 10 days, the mayor were changed completely. And okay, the, so the people then, okay, that's, so the, the, the regime is under pressure, let's press more. And so they go and go and, and keep going, keep going, keep going. And eventually, within six months, they were, they were armed. And so if the Assad, released them, who armed them. So the Assad released them and armed them and they, 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 he killed his soldiers and what? It's just like, like you know, it's, it's like it's endless, endless chain of, of conspiracy theories. So what happened simply, it's, there was a protesting, somebody has interest to create a war in Syria, they want the Assad down, especially the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, because they will not forget that the Assad in 2006 up in, you know, up in the victory in Lebanon, they, he went on public and he said, you know, these are half men people, Gulf period indicating for the Gulf period people, these half men people, they are now uh, known very well as a traitors or something and they have to punish him for that. So there's a political issue in this and there is a for sure democracy issue is this and there's a lot of mixed things in it, but the, the very true thing is that more than half of the country doesn't want this war and they want the Assad to stay. Until this day, I would say the majority of Syrians, they are with Assad and the minority that are against Assad, they just wish that, they wish that this war never happened. Yeah. Also, they, they, he, uh, at the beginning, he also changed the decree when the, uh, there was a decree where the Hezb al Ba'ath is but the sole governor or uh, ruler of the country. Also, after a little, a little bit of time and of the protest, also the, this decree was, uh, took, uh, was taken off. So they made a lot of change, changement, but it was, it was meant to be, the war was meant to be. It was uh, uh, paid by Turkey, Saudis, uh, backed by US, by whatever you want, they wanted the war to be in Syria. It's not about uh, Assad or anything else. They wanted a regime change because they wanted so, not because the people wanted to change the regime. Uh, Assad, especially Bashar Assad, was very much uh, loved and liked by all the people before the war. And uh, Syria was growing and it was, uh, before the war, it was a great country. It was uh, growing at, uh, all the uh, sectors. Banking, schools, education, but they didn't want. They want uh, war at any price. They want to change the regime. Who want everybody else, but but not the Syrian? Thanks for your answers. I want to get to more questions. Um, this is one from uh, David Mandel. Uh, in the early two thousands. Uh, did the uh, did the Syrian government uh, cooperate with the United States uh, with regard to covert programs of rendition uh, and torture? And what happened to change that cooperative uh, relationship between Syria and the United States? 
you asking me? Uh, and you sure, Jeff, if you have an answer, I would like, I'd like to hear so, it. So Syria uh, had no interest in permanent hostility with the United States. And there was a period uh, before 2000 when uh, there was an attempt to uh, improve relations with the United States. You may remember that Syria was part of the anti uh, 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 Hussein uh, uh, struggle in to liberate Kuwait from the Iraqi army, like other Arab countries. Uh, it, it, my sense is, and, and also in the early 2000s, John Kerry, Nancy Pelosi went to meet with Assad to try to uh, smooth out relations. Uh, and basically, my sense is that uh, the U.S. allies in the area were very hostile to Syria. And when the Arab Spring broke out, there was a perception that here was an opportunity to overthrow a regime that either was hostile or unreliable from the United States point of view, and, and, and especially one that was very hostile to Israel, the US's, uh, one of the US's main allies in the region. So they took that opportunity to uh, try to overthrow uh, the Assad regime. And, and of course, democracy had nothing to do with it. At the time when the US was arming rebels in Syria, our closest allies were uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and the United Arab Emirates monarchies that are not democratic at all, uh, Jordan, which is a monarchy, and Egypt, which had been a dictatorship, briefly democratic, and then returned to dictatorship and remained an ally of the U.S. throughout this whole period. So the idea that the U.S. intervened in Syria on behalf of democracy is, is laughable, frankly, and every Syrian knows that, I think. Uh, and I don't know if Amar and Chantal have any, anything to say. I, I would add something that I I remember up when the, the Baghdad, Mario, Baghdadi assassin, up, uh, assassination that Donald Trump went on the. I'm you're, sorry. You're good. You're good. Uh, can now. you hear me now? You're breaking. I just okay. wanted to make sure you were heard. Up, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, uh, up in the, the Baghdadi assassination, Donald Trump went on public and he sang Syria. And but by we mean Syria, I would say the Syrian regime for the help in taking down al Baghdadi. So I would say that cooperation on the basic, on the security service issue never stopped. And Syria was a great help to uh, capture the people of the 2000, September 11, 2001 people, uh, a cooperative, and they provide uh, many information about how to end up end up uh, capturing those people. The thing is, to be honest, the, the United States always demand and demand and demand and demand. They never stop asking things and more and more and more. And, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the funny thing is really that like, like an incident like September 11 was like uh, to 19 uh, 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 person involved. 12 of them, 12 of them was Saudi Arabia national uh, and and I'm wondering still those people, Saudi Arabia people can enter the United States with open visas and can do, they, they can do whatever they want. And the Syrians will have a zero history in violence against any country, not only the United States. There's no, no, no bombing in the world that involved Syrians. These Syrians, they are creative, very hardworking people, very honest, very, very, very educated. Most of the doctors in uh, in United States are Syrians. Those people are now banned from entering the United States, and the Saudi Arabia people were, were just mostly 70, 30 percent of them. I would say they are really. Uh, I, I'm not gonna uh, stereotype, but I said a, a, a big portion of them are radicalists for sure, and they can't enter the country just like that simply. And this double criterion policy put the foreign policy, the American foreign policy under big questions. And people all around the world start to question our honesty because they don't understand outside that the foreign policy is a, under the constitution is a president thing. They understand it's United States. And this guy 
is elected by Americans. And no matter what the foreign policy is, his policy or the United States official policy, people start really to question our integrity in this entire thing. Chantal, do you have anything to, to add? No, he said it all. <laughs> let, let, let me just uh, say that uh, in the 1990s, the Syrians were negotiating seriously with the United States uh, for settlement with Israel. Uh, and they were willing to make peace with Israel provided that the Israeli occupied Golan uh, territory was returned to Syria, as had happened with Egypt and the Sinai. And in the end, uh, the U.S. and the Israelis would not agree. They could have had peace with Syria in uh, the late 1990s, uh, but they were not willing to return the Syrian occupied territory. And uh, that's why the state of war continues. Technically, there's a state of war continuing between Syria and Israel. And of course, Israel has intervened uh, massively in the, uh, the Syrian uh, conflict. Uh, it has armed and supported rebels near uh, its border in occupied Golan and periodically and regularly bombed uh, Syrian military facilities almost every week, uh, which is barely reported. And when it is reported, it's basically cheered on by the United States media as a good thing. Yeah, well, we have gone over time, but it's such a fascinating uh, discussion. I, I want to ask uh, one final question uh, myself, because I think you've laid it out quite well, uh, the, the three of you. It really is a cognitive dissonance uh, going on and a massive double standard. Uh, um, like as Amar said about our relationship with Saudi Arabia, just a, just a couple of months ago, uh, a Saudi pilot uh, that was being trained in Florida killed two service members, two United States service members in Pensacola, Florida. And to think if that was a Syrian national or an Iranian national, what the reaction of the American people would be. But since it was a Saudi Arabian pilot, uh, one of our allies, uh, it seems that it, it, the, the news came and went in a flash. Uh, a, as you said, many of our allies in the region are uh, monarchies, some of them absolute monarchies. Uh, you may say that uh, democracy in Syria in, and Iran is, is flawed, but they are republics. <laughs> and, and, our democracy in the United States is definitely flawed as well. I don't mean to criticize, but how do we get that message out um, to counter the narrative uh, that is going on right now that, that demonizes countries like Iran and Syria, despite the fact that they do have democracy? They are republics, after all. Uh, it seems so clear to me that we are uh, on the side of more repressive governments, but how, how do we get that message out uh, to people, uh, because it seems like a clear one, but it's not one that the American people are hearing. So I would just okay. urge people of goodwill uh, to understand that the narrative that they're being fed by our media is very one-sided. Uh, and, and we're trying to present today uh, another point of view. Uh, and uh, if you argue that our presentation is one-sided, it's so because we're, it's the side that you never allowed to hear from in the United yeah. States. Uh, so no one would claim that we speak, uh, or Amar Ashandal speaks for all Syrians, but these are Syrian voices that you are never permitted to hear in the United States media, never, as opposed to uh, the anti-government side, which is, which is uh, you know, trumpeted everywhere on television, the news, the media. So for people of goodwill, I would just urge that you be skeptical of what you hear about Syria in the mainstream media and try to find alternative sources of information. Uh, try to speak to uh, uh, Syrians here, Syrian Americans and Syrians there who uh, have a variety of opinions uh, that you uh, don't see on TV or in, uh, in the newspapers. And and read about it. I, I've written a lot about Syria. I, uh, uh, I urge people who want to know more to, you can Google Jeff Klein plus Syria and find a number of articles I've written. Uh, I wouldn't claim that any of them are definitive, 
but again, it's a it's an it's a point of view and information that you won't get unless you look for it. I want to uh, add that the, the, those sanctions on Syria are on Syria. Why? Because the government and the Assad is killing people. That's what they say. I want to ask them if there is barbarians and terrorists who are fighting against you in any way in, in New York, in Paris. What they do? They send them SMS or roses, or they have to fight against them. That's what people abroad are never understanding. How can we manage to liberate Syria from those terrorists without uh, killing them or, or uh, fighting them? And how we are going to fight them? There is only way is to, uh, to go in a war with them. For that, we have having sanctions. This is not fair at all, Jan, at all. I want everybody abroad to, to think, if there is terrorists in his neighborhood, what should he do? What should the government do? This is the main question that uh, everybody must ask this himself anywhere in the world. Do they accept that? Or they ask and they urge the government and the military to come and uh, uh, liberate it from them? This is the, the main question. And for that, we have having all those sanctions who are, are not, uh, the sanctions have no effects, anything on ending the war or advancing toward a politic, uh, political solution. It's, not, it's have another, no in any effect, but putting more the people, no fuel, no electricity, no bread. Even the weight, weight now we are forbidden to have it for the industry of bread. No bread, nothing, even medicine, even ventilators, we cannot import. Thanks God now, sometimes Russia and China are managing to send some, some by so so hard way to come to Syria, but uh, no, the people here are, are struggling and suffering from them, those sanctions. I urge them to to talk about this anyway. Can I add something? It. Yes, yes, of course, please. Actually, I, I want I want to I want to address the Americans. I'm not in position to address the Americans, but my message, little, it's election, guys. It's not about tax and health system and and medical for all. It's not just about. There is a part of what affects the Americans foreign policy. So when you have to choose a president or whatever, we have to know that there is a foreign policy involved and it affects badly the Americans all around the world. And we became targets of all radicals because of this foreign policy. So my message is as well, if you want to play the, the World Cup, are you going to be the World Police, World Cup for America, playing this role? Fine, but you have to play it with honest, way because nobody will respect any corrupt cop if you're gonna be corrupt police ward nobody will respect you thank you guys well i want to thank you you all as especially amar and, and chantal for sharing your perspective and, and jeff for for organizing uh this event uh, i think uh what you've said is incredibly important for people to hear uh we need to hear the other side um and we, we simply are not. So we're gonna try and get this message out as much as possible and to fight against these sanctions in Syria as well. Um, I know the rationalization is that uh, somehow Syria is a threat to the United States, but uh, I have never heard, I have never heard a good explanation as to why. Uh, so I think these, these arguments that are so often made in the mainstream media, they fall to pieces when they're examined, uh, even casually. So we need to uh, keep putting the truth out, keep hearing voices uh, like yours, Amar, and, and yours, Chantal. And I, I can't thank you enough for, for being with us here today. Uh, I want to let all the attendees know that we will be sending out a follow-up email uh, with a recording of this webinar. Uh, so please share with your friends who weren't able to attend. Uh, we need to spread this message. Uh, we need to get it out. We need to get it heard. Uh, there's also going to be a, a meeting of the Middle East Working Group uh, coming up uh, on Tuesday night. And uh, we will be inviting uh, interesting party, interested parties to, to join us to, to help us spread this message. If you're interested in doing that work, we would love to welcome you, welcome you in. Uh, to Mass Peace Action. Uh, 
And I also want to let people know that uh, there will be another webinar coming up on Wednesday night at 7 uh, p.m. where we will uh, examine, uh, once again, uh, sanctions uh, and their effect on Iran and their ability to fight the coronavirus. Uh, they are already in the midst of one of the worst outbreaks in the world. And we all hope and pray that that will not be the case uh, in Syria. So I want to thank everyone, and we will be staying in touch. Uh, we are not thank going you. to stop spreading this message and uh, thank featuring you. voices. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And everyone have a wonderful Sunday. Bye. Bye. You stay safe, guys. Bye. And you okay, too. Okay, you too. Stay safe and well. <laughs> and stay peace. at home. Bye-bye. Peace. Bye. Peace.